What is going on out there, everybody? You are back here with us on Expanded Perspectives with me, your host, Mr. Cam Hale, and my the Siegfried to my Roy, <laughs> Mr. Kyle Filson. <laughs> How's it going out there? I don't really. The Siegfried and Roy thing's funny, but it's not, so I'm probably, I don't know, it's just kind of awkward. Which one was so. the one that got attacked, Roy? <sighs> Wasn't it the bull? I was a dark. I, dude, I don't know. Man, I don't know. One of them got eaten up by a tiger. A tiger. And I heard it was because he was having a heart attack, and he fell down, and the tiger knew it. So the tiger picked him up by the mouth and carried him to safety. But you know what I saw? I saw some things on Discovery one time that they must have been a lot of small forest drilling creatures having a lot of heart attacks. Because I saw tigers picking them up the same way and carrying them off, too. Oh, the three fellows in the Sunda <laughs> Band that were, like, in that boat? <laughs> They're like crazy. I just think the tiger went tiger is what I think. I think he went straight tiger. You can't hate on a tiger for going tiger. No. He went straight whip tiger. That whip at him, make him jump through all those yeah. hoops. He probably just said, enough's enough. Listen, I don't like your hair. I don't like the fact the tiger's white. Those guys are orange. Isn't that supposed to be the other way around? Yeah. These guys been in a tanning bed. He's like, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to eat this guy. That's what happened. Yeah, you get out of line. That's what happened. And speaking What's the of, other fella doing? Watching it happen. No, now. Oh, I don't know. Probably wiping that dude's mouth. I don't know. Hmm. I'm not a huge Siegfried and Roy fan. It's just funny. And yeah. speaking of ridiculousness, did you want, spoiler alert, if you hadn't seen it, it's stupid. The new Bigfoot movie, or the Bigfoot, I'm sorry, the Bigfoot $10 million bounty. Yeah, it's a complete waste of time. It's yeah. a complete waste of time. Again, you know, this subject's never going to get treated serious because of these stupid shows. You've got... This is the worst one I've ever seen. Ever. I thought Finding Bigfoot was bad. This is worse than that. Yeah, this is This is, this terrible. is Survivor, but they looking for Bigfoot. With leather and not chains really looking for... and mohawks and chicks and yeah, camo. Let's get into it. Okay, so there's like... I watched episode one last night. Yes. First, it's the first time I've ever seen it. Of course, yes. it was the first time it aired. There's like 10 teams of two. It's like a guy and his wife, you know, a couple yes. guys. It doesn't matter. Like 10 teams of two, and they're on this show. And also, they have a primatologist, and they have a biologist from NYU on there. Is that what the guy? I forgot. They do with the glasses and the mohawk. Yeah, that no, I've seen them on yeah. numerous other yeah. things. I like that guy. Right. And what these teams are supposedly going to do is – Try to find evidence of Bigfoot. Whoever yes. finds the most evidence wins a $10 million prize. The problem is the, the premise sounds good, but then when you start watching the show, the first five minutes, they have a challenge. And the challenge is to take some tranquilizer gun, shoot any animal they You're can find. You're on a game, little game reserve. Right. Shoot an animal. One of them shoots a rabbit. You know, one shoots a yak. And you got to pull. The, the dart falls out, and you take the dart back, and it proves that you know that you can hit these animals to retrieve DNA and hair right. samples. And the first person to do it, runs up the hill after they shoot this animal and gives the DNA to the scientist. Scientist tests it. And the first person that turns it in, that turns it in, and it has some some DNA on it. So immediately, it's like a game show. They win the challenge. And challenge for winning that challenge, they get a two-hour head start looking for big hunt. It's stupid. So then again, at the end of the show, uh, whoever didn't do anything, they get kicked off. So every week, they're going to kick another person off. It's just like American Idol. It's just like the sing-off. It's just like Survivor. It's a stupid show. You know, if you're really seriously looking for Sasquatch, then why are you kicking people off? Why don't yeah. you really try to split up, use as many resources as possible to find this thing? It's 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 stupid. It's a game show, but they've named Bigfoot. I'll say this. Finding Bigfoot annoys me at times. It's better than this show. But it is a hundred times better than this show. I'll watch Finding – if I had to pick the two, I'll stick with, with Matt and Bobo and Renee and Cliff all day long compared to this crap that they've got on. This is a ridiculous show. It is ridiculous. At least in Finding Bigfoot, every episode you get to see some video footage or a sound bite of something. Yeah. I mean, this is just people just running around the woods doing stupid. You got guys rubbing elk shit in their hair. Yeah. What's next week? An obstacle course? Oh, and folks, let me lay this on you. You've heard me and Kyle rant about Justin Smeha in the past. Well, guess what? He's on this show. And uh, they're sitting around asking everybody to raise their hands. Anybody if they've seen, ever seen one. You ever seen I had an encounter? And he's like, I shot two of them. And everybody looks at him like he's crazy. And then he has to go and tell the DNA man that they found out that uh, the DNA says it was it was m- ma- mainly, the DNA was mainly feral human. And uh, the dude with the mohawk, the, the, the DNA fellow, he's like, uh, you don't test for feral human. It's either human or it isn't. So yeah. feral is an activity. You know, it's like saying I'm a sprinting human or I'm a climbing human. No, 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 you're a human. And he's like, well, if it's human DNA, uh, then you committed murder. It's what you've done. Right. Well, and he's full of shit anyways. We already know from already the, know bear. the new evidence Bigfoot show that yeah. it was a bear. And then I like how he Professor brags on Sykes. this show. Yeah. 
I choked one of them to death. I, choked it, I shot that little in the neck, and he wasn't dead, so I choked him to death. If you take a good look at him, look, I'm not hating on anybody. I'm kind of a heavy set guy myself, but he looks like he's choked on a lot of hamburgers. Justin Smeha looks like he needs to stick to doing whatever he's doing and get off the Bigfoot trail. I'm telling what you. What he's doing is making money from all these stupid yeah, It's shows. ridiculous. Like I said, he may be a really good guy. I would really no, like to meet him. I don't think him. he is. You don't, don't think, think so? You think he's a douche? I do. I would His like story to meet changes him. all the time from the other show. Uh, it was found out that it was a bear. Now he's on this show, and I'm, maybe this was recorded before that yeah. one. He's claiming that it was a feral human, which is totally made up. I would like to meet and talk to Justin. I really would, because I would like. I would just be like, how do you expect anybody to believe the story? So you passed a polygraph. Well, there's a lot of people who've passed polygraphs that weren't telling the truth. It's not a hundred percent a legit thing. A polygraph. It's not a hundred percent guarantee. They said he's passed a couple of polygraphs. Yeah, well, that's so awesome. What? You know, I mean, that's awesome. But the story doesn't His story add flip up. flops too. And one time you'll hear him interviewed, he'll say he shot it and he saw it and it was dying and choking and he was sad and he was crying and tearing up. Then he is on this show. It's a completely different story. I shot it. It wasn't idiot. I choked it to death. And he's like almost proud of it. Yeah. And then on one show, know. oh, it turns out it's bare evidence. And then another show, oh, yeah, it turned out it was feral human. His story, it's BS. Let me ask you this, Kyle. It's made up, so I don't trust him. Do you think they put him on there for name recognition? Probably, yeah. Because I didn't everybody recognize else, any of the other nah, guys. Of course not. I just wonder if they stuck him on there for name recognition. Yep, that's what it is. He's, I don't know, man. Like I said, I'm not hating on Justin at all. He may be a great guy. He may be a wonderful father and a, and a husband. I don't know. Well, I'm not but his story, about that, but he's untruthful. His story sounds like bullshit. It just straight up. And the show doesn't help it any. No. The They've already wrong. made him out to be a bad guy. Did you see the way they played it? If everybody that's watched, the way you watch it, the way they filmed that show when he's doing all that, they've already played it out where nobody in the whole camp likes Justin. Hmm. They already think, oh, you can't kill a Bigfoot and all that stuff. I'm like, the show is garbage. I mean, that's my opinion. I hope if you love it, good for you. But I think the show is garbage. And this will probably be, unless something really interesting happens, like one of them ends up darting one of the other teammates or something funny happens, uh, I'm not speaking of it anymore. It's dead to me. I'm not watching the show again. You know nothing's going to happen. I'm done. You know nothing's going to happen. Now, I will tell you this. I have found a show I do like. What's that? The Curse of Oak Island on the History Channel. Hey, I saw that. That was pretty neat. That's I think pretty I saw neat, it right? Sunday, last yeah, Sunday. Yeah, I think it's going to come on again this Sunday. It's it's every Sunday series of The Curse of Oak Island. I almost I wish you would have done a story on Oak Island before the series. We could still do one. We yeah. could still do one and kind of get into the more of the history. I mean, they did a good job, but they didn't go into in-depth history on the whole thing. But I tell you what, it's an interesting little story. Now, like I said, I don't know if anything's come from it just because... We haven't heard anything about it. I'm sure the show was being filmed. I think they said they started in June. They started in February 2012. Then they came back and picked up their drilling and all the work in uh, June of 2012. I'm sorry, 2013, last year. So I'm sure it's already what they call in the can. So if we'd heard anything, we probably would have already known about it by now. Something would have been leaked, but we'll see. But uh, yeah, anyway, folks, like I said, look, I'm not slandering anybody. I'm not slamming anybody. I'm just saying it's a bit of a joke, the, the, the Bigfoot. Uh, Bounty and Justin Smeha's story and there's a lot of them in there and if you haven't seen it do yourself a favor and familiarize yourself with it and get yourself a good laugh but I would say one's enough and <laughs> if you can DVR it DVR it so you can fast forward through a bunch of the bullcrap I would but suggest not even watching it <laughs> <laughs> oh, so Philly who we got with us tonight man tonight we got uh, Robert Sullivan it's a great interview yeah it's, it's going to be neat we're going to talk about the Royal Arch of Enoch we get into some Masonic history yeah do a lot of, and, and, Robert, and Robert's a great guy. Man, oh, he was yeah. a super great guy to talk to on air, off air. Very knowledgeable about everything. I mean, the book is a tome. I mean, he's he's done his homework. He's done a lot of work on the book. I was really uh, leery at first because I was like, man, this is a subject that I really don't know a lot about. And we got some links. We did some research, looked into it, and really dove into the subject. And I love it. I really got fascinated with it's the whole thing. Neat, it's man. a really great history. I'm with you. I didn't know much about Freemasonry and all that stuff, so it's pretty neat. Oh, uh, man. I think everybody's going to enjoy it. If you enjoy any kind of history, anything like that, and it's also kind of gives you an inside look. You know, it kind of lets you get a little a little inside track to Masonry, and a lot, of, a lot of people don't have that, so it's really enjoyable. Robert was a great guy, so. Well, let's get into it. Just jump right in. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives.
All right, guys. Well, joining us this evening, where we're going to be recording it this evening, is Mr. Robert W. Sullivan the Fourth, and he is the author of the book The Royal Ark of Enoch. I think I pronounced it right. It is Ark, right? Is it, Robert? Uh, it's Arch. Actually. Arch, the Royal Arch of Enoch. All right. Folks, for those of you that don't know, it is we're going to jump into Masonic stuff. Robert is the walking encyclopedia of Masonic everything, so we are going to be prying into his brain for the next hour or so and discussing his book and discussing everything else that is involved in it. So, Robert, how are you doing tonight? Oh, hello, guys. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you tonight on Expanded Perspectives. Or excuse me, Expanded per- per- Perspectives. I'm doing great. Um, a cold outside, but um, I'm inside and uh, everything's well. And it's uh, again great to be here with you guys. Oh, we really look forward to this. This is yeah, going to be a lot yeah. of fun. It's a lot of stuff. Kyle and I are interested. Like I said, you, we saw, we've listened to some of your other interviews. We saw some of the other things that you had done online, and it kind of got our our minds turning. Like I said, we were new to all these things, and we kind of we've turned over a new leaf and really got to looking into this stuff. And there's a lot of neat rituals and and just neat history. And I, Kyle and I are both big history nuts, so this really plays right into that. And sure. I, I guess before we jump into it, can you explain to people that maybe not know who Enoch is? Before we even start, before we need to go to the base of it. Who was Enoch and the things that, that we can talk about with him before we jump into the book upon which it was kind of named after? Right, right. Well, what, Enoch is, um, his, name, his name in Hebrew means initiate. He is one of um, two people in the Bible never to experience a physical death. He is taken into heaven in corporeal form. Um, the, other, the other person is the prophet Elijah. Um, right off the bat, in the book of Genesis, um, we're talking um, Genesis five eighteen to 24, um, we are told that Enoch's years on earth were 365. So we're dealing with a solar, a solar reference um, with this guy, and there are numerous of these in the Bible, not only in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament as well. But at any rate, um, he is, he is um, like I said, one of two people to never die, and he's, he's carted into heaven. And um, r- really, in, in, in the Bible, um, you know, that, that's the limitation of Enoch. Um, and then we have this other book um, that dates to the Second Temple period, around 350 um, B.C., called the Book of Enoch, or One Enoch. And this book um, documents kind of what he sees in heaven um, and, you know, in his journey in the afterlife. Um, and, you know, it's explained that, you know, he interacts with these archangels um, and a group of fallen angels known as the Watchers um, who have displeased God by coming down to Earth and, you know, mating with human women, creating this race of giants called the Nephilim. Um, and, and, you know, he, he, you know, he has a lot of esoteric, Kabbalistic wisdom explained to him. The book's very esoteric. Um, and, and in a nutshell, um, you know, that's who Enoch, you know, Enoch is in the Bible. And uh, someone, someone just came asking me about this before. It's like, well, what happened to him? Um, you know, and I, I know, you know, we, we, you kind of, you know, we maybe gleaned on some cinema symbolism, um, you know, towards maybe the end of this broadcast. Enoch and the prophet Elijah, since they never die, um, are considered the two witnesses to Revelation um, in the New Testament. The two witnesses of Revelation are generally thought to be um, the prophet Elijah and Enoch. Um, and I mentioned cinema symbolism and even you know, more TV. Um, this is going on in this move or this television show right now called Sleepy Hollow, where these two characters are quote unquote these two witnesses um, to Revelation or the end days. But yeah, Enoch and Elijah are considered um, the two witnesses in Revelation. And um, again, he's one of um, two people to never experience a uh, material, you know, a physical death. Mm-hmm. Well, I know every time I always thought about like Enoch and when, to, when I went to reading and, and learning more about it, it always brought me back to to John D because it always comes up with the Enochian magic or the Enochian books that John D himself had. And for those of you that aren't familiar with John D, he was a mathematician and an astronomer and an astrologer and all these things and a cultist from, uh, he was a Welsh descent, but he was from England. Uh, and I believe it was in the early 1500s, 15, 1527 uh, to like 1608, 09 was when John D lived. But I know that, that it links kind of back to him that they believe that he is the guy that, that actually kept some of the book of Enoch around because I know around what was it the first century BC it kind of got lost people it kind of vanished until it came back up in the what was it in the 1700s again or so from Ethiopia wasn't it well well let's talk about that because you're, you're you're on the right track there um, we had the book of Enoch one Enoch is lost to history um, is, is is off of the pages of Western civilization for lack of a better word from around the second third century. Um, all the way up until 1773, um, that's irrefutable. Um, and like I said, the limitation, you know, it's really the non-limitation of Masonic 
um, information about Enoch is what, what I mentioned earlier, Genesis 5, 18 to 24. There's another part in Jude 8, uh, 14, 15 that also mentions him very briefly. But you're correct. The book of Enoch and its contents are lost to, the, um, are lost to history until 1773 when a Freemason named James Bruce returns from, from Ethiopia to Europe with copies um, and they're deposited in the basement of the Bodleian Library at Oxford University, and they're not even translated into English until 1821. Yet what my book talks about, the Royal Arch of Enoch, is this higher degree ceremony um, that's being developed in France in the 1740s, um, 1750s, called the Royal Arch of Enoch. I mean, it's named after the, the patriarch. is incorporating elements of one Enoch into it, you know, into its ritual, into its symbolism, into its philosophy, into its storyline, into its underlying history, um, which will happening. So, so it begs the question, then, you know, where, where could this copy have come from? Is it part of some sort of secret tradition or, or, or library or something to that effect? And, of course, one of the characters that could have owned this, owned this book, and, you know, you're right on with the time frame, is this guy in England named Dr. John Dee, who is Queen Elizabeth's court astronomer, astrologer, um, he is a, a navigator, he's a mathematician, you, your description was spot on. Um, and again, you were correct, he develops this system of conjuring um, using scrying techniques, which is staring in the black me mirrors with another medium called Edward Kelly. Um, and and, and it's, it's a source of conjuring where you can summon angels and demons um, for various purposes. Um, and, you know, you know the, the, the ultimate purpose of this is to finally communicate with your holy guardian angel. And this, this language of, of communicating with the angels is known as Enochian, named after the biblical patriarch, which can't be a coincidence. I mean, you know, how, you know, I mean, what, why, is, why is he naming this, this system of magic after this guy, this communication with these angels? I mean, of course, this is being completely paralleled in the book of Enoch, where Enoch communicates with the archangels in his watcher group. Um, and then, of course, we have the fact that Dee's um, library was one of the largest in Europe at the time, um, and we also know, and, and th this is one of the great tip-offs to, to Dee being, you know, where you point the finger at him, is, um, is Sir Walter Raleigh. In Sir Walter Raleigh's History of the World, Raleigh actually mentions the astronomy contents of the astronomy book of One Enoch. And um, we know that Raleigh, along with people like, you know, Francis Drake, Walsingham, Giordana Bruno, were all part of Elizabeth's spy network. Um, you know, and they operated through various mystical groups. The Rosicrucians was one of these. Um, and, you know, you know, it begs the question, well, where is Raleigh getting this from? And, of course, the answer is Dr. John Dee. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Dee, Dee is, you know, a very strong candidate for being a person, um, you know, and I agree with you, who, who definitely could have possessed a copy of this book prior to Bruce returning, you know, from the West, or, you know, from Ethiopia with a copy, or, or at least maybe he had a very highly detailed summary of one Enoch. I mean, very possible. It is funny that it comes that, now, we know that, that modern Freemasonry was founded in 1717, correct? Yeah, that's right. The, the Freemasonry as a modern organization is form, formulated in England on June 24th, 1717. Now, and, and who was, you said, the fellow that came back from Ethiopia with a copy of this that uh, was in, like, the 1780s, correct? Right. Well, what 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 you have is I'll uh, just just backpedal a little bit, just so so we're you know just so people know the history. You have in 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 seventeen seventeen you have really the formation of what's called modern day Freemasonry. This is where you have the formation of you know these you know the finalization of these three degrees of Freemasonry, which are entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason. It's not until you complete the master mason degree that you can hold yourself out as a Freemason. We know. Um, and this is irrefutable also, that these Masonic lodges existed prior to this date. Um, we know they existed in the 1600s. Um, the fact that we know that is through this um, Oxford lawyer named Elias Ashmole, who was initiated, and he writes in his journal that he was initiated into a lodge of Freemasonry. Um, and Ashmole also um, um, uh, uh, affiliates with the Rosicrucians as well. Ashmole is an interesting character. He, he collects a lot of artifacts and antiquities, um, and is, uh, there's the Ashmolean uh, Museum in Oxford University, which has these, and he was the um, owner of the real famous painting of John Dee, which you see all over the place. Um, Ashmole gets the painting of Dee, and you can see that in the uh, museum. But, but what you have going on then is in the 1740s, you have this cultivation of the higher degrees of Freemasonry, um, and this is what's called the Rite of Perfection, and it's part of this rite where you have the incorporation in this one particular degree um, of the contents of the Book of Enoch. And again, we had this going on in the 1740s, 1750s. 
um, possibly even as late as the 1730s, um, you know, in the late 1730s. But yeah, you're correct. The um, we, we, you know, you know, this is all prior to Bruce coming back to Europe in 1773 with copies of One Enoch, and again, even when he returns with them, they're just they go untranslated until 1821. So um, you know, you know, we clearly have some, something going on where someone out there in Europe is seeing a copy of this book. You know, D is a very likely candidate. Um, I point to a character in the Royal Arch of Enoch named Andrew Michael Ramsey. Um, who, who really gets into this esoterica with Enoch. Um, he mentions it in his um, famed oration of 1737. And, of course, there are references to Enoch in the secret underground vault in Anderson's Constitutions. So, you know, you have this Masonic knowledge of Enoch that is not, you know, generally out there to the public, and it's certainly not out there prior to Bruce coming um, from Ethiopia with these copies. So you definitely clearly have this, you know, historical anomaly going on, which is the um, heart and soul of uh, my book. Well, and that's what I was getting at, was it seems like uh, the Masons were more of a secretive society way back before, of course, before now, and, and the freedom of information and things we have now. And it almost seems like if just following the breadcrumbs of history, that the Masons or somebody involved in some sort of Masonic rituals, be it a hermetic or be it any sort of, or sort of esoteric, had this from maybe even the first century, that this has been carried on a long time behind the scenes before it finally started getting to be a little bit more well-known as recent as the 1600s. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly possible. Um, I believe I believe it's it's sort of thought of generally. I'd have to go look this up. I talk about it in the book that one of the last people to, um, to, to that we know that actually had a copy of the One Enoch was a character um, in Alexandria, Egypt, named Origen. Um, and it's interesting that a copy would fall into his hands because he's one of the compilers of the New Testament. And Origen is the student of Clement of Alexandria. And Origen, um, it, when, when you, you know, we're getting into controversial subject matter here. I don't <laughs> mind talking about it. No, no, but, 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 but what you have going on is, you know, you talk about the secret esoteric tradition, you know, in this Book of Enoch sort of, you know, hidden behind the backgrounds. I mean, you will see the fingerprints of the Book of Enoch all over the New Testament. I mean, just right off the bat, um, you know, you have Jesus calling himself the Son of Man. That comes straight out of one Enoch. You have numerous of the apostles quoting from the Book of Enoch. Um, you'll have astral solar references referred to in, by the apostles. This, again, is coming right out of the Book of Enoch. Um, you know, and then you get into this kind of hidden tradition, you know, in secret tradition. You know, you've got groups like the Gnostics that seem to have carried this on, groups like the Cathars. They seem to, you know, be in tune with something like this. I've been asked this question before, and it's a very valid question. Is that, you know, and, and this is kind of where you get into this, you know, sh- you know Andrew Michael Ramsey linkage to this is, um, you know, and it's tying with masonry is, you know, is the Book of Enoch, um, you know, is this possibly one of the things that was covered by the Knights Templar, you know, this Roman Catholic uh, militant order in the Middle Ages, you know, during their time in the Holy Land, is, is this something that they could have potentially have found on the Temple Mount and have brought back to Europe? you know, that ultimately found itself into some sort of hermetic tradition or library, you know, and ultimately fell into the hands of D and, you know, take it from there. Um, you know, that's certainly, you know, very possible also. But, yeah, you clearly ha- seem to have working behind the scenes this sort of, you know, in- Enochian influence, you know, going on when it really shouldn't be, um, you know, and again, because, you know, the, the book is really out of out of the hands of Western civilization to 1821. It, yeah, it doesn't seem accidental. It doesn't seem like it was just tucked away and then all of a sudden stumbled upon years and years later it seems like it was almost you know hand to hand passed on from father to son or however it would be to and almost and, kept a secret yeah and, and purpose. purposely kept right. a secret yeah yeah i mean it's 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 very it's very possible um you know and again when you get into this you know you have these secret groups um you know kind of you know you know these these you know secret societies which you know obviously masonry you know is sort of copying you know, you go all the way back to the ancient mystery schools that predate Christianity, things like, you know, the mysteries of Egypt with Osiris and Osi- you know, Isis, you know, the Persian mysteries of Zoroastrianism, Mithraism, you know, Pythagoras, um, who had his own mystery school, um, the mystery, the Greco-Roman mysteries of Eleusis, you know, Freemasonry borrows from these heavily, and then you get into, of course, you know, the Cathars, you know, pre- before then the Gnostics, then we get into this Knight Templar, you know, connection, nexus, then you get into groups like the, you know, Rosicrucians, which are sort of this proto free run, forerunner of Freemasonry. Then you you have to point the finger also 
of this other very esoteric order known as the Society of Jesus, better known to history as the Jesuits. Um, I know, you know, when people hear that, they think of the Jesuits in the 21st century terms. That that is a wrong interpretation. Back in the day, these guys were Europe's supreme mystics. You know, these guys were heavily into mysticism, esoterica. Um, they were founded. Their founder was 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 very mystic. I mean, and even in his writings, you'll hear things that he was basing the Jesuits on this, you know, on the priestcrafts of ancient Egypt. Um, you know, basically being the solar mystical clerisy that kind of moderated society. So, you know, and, and the reason you can also point to the Jesuits is I talk about this in the Royal Arch of Enoch book is, you know, we talked about earlier, you know, the cultivation of the formulation of the blue degrees in 1717. And it's not until the higher degrees come late, you know, the high degrees come later out of Paris, France. Um, and, you know, I say in the book and other Masonic authors have mentioned this, the hands of the Jesuits cultivating these higher degrees. Um, this is part of the Counter-Reformation to weaken Protestantism, um, you know, and Freemasonry, which was flour flourishing at the time. And, of course, we know Freemason, you know, Freemasonry is growing out of England. And, of course, if you know your history, you know, the Jesuits were always trying to do England in after since, you know, since the Spanish Armada. So, um, you know, you will see the fingerprints of the Jesuits all over the higher degrees. Um, and, of course, you know, it, it, it's very possible that, you know, the, the Jesuits... Um, could have, you know, had a copy of this in one of their libraries, um, and this is not a stretch at all. Um, we know that there's there's a document out there called the Voynich Manuscript. Mm -hmm. This is a very out, yeah, this is a very alchemical secret, um, you know, grimoire that's attributed to your friend and mine, Doctor John D. We know that this was once owned by a Jesuit priest named Athanathus Kircher, who is very into mysticism. So, so the, you know, the Jesuits could have also been in this. And then, of course, you have modern-day Freemasonry that seems to be carrying this on. You know, and again, in the late 1700s, you have this other group, the Illuminati, that, you know, is, again, mystical Freemasonry. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I tend to agree with you guys on that point, that this definitely seems to be kind of working behind the scenes. Well, it's something that Kyle and I had discussed a while back, and, and we talked about it even some more this, this today, is it seems like the, the roots of a lot of the Freemasonry, it almost seems like you could trace it back to the stone builders in Egypt and a lot of the hermetic and esoteric studies and, and the spirituality and the things that they've done, even as like some of the Egyptian high magic, some of the priests from back then, seems like they've picked pieces from here and there and brought into their rituals and carried it all the way forward. But it seems like somewhere along the way, and it may have been after, I, I know it's been attributed to uh, uh, the, William, the William Morgan incident in the 1800s, mid-1800s. Uh, it seems like they lost a little bit and kind of almost made it more, I guess for a better, a lack of a better term, family friendly than, than keeping it so mystic. It almost like it turned into a, a club of, of just guys almost changing to do less of the mystic, less of the wild rituals, less of the things like that, and almost got away from their roots of that to try to evolve with the times. And then it almost feels like now due to the, the freedom of information and the nostalgic feeling that everyone's getting now, it's almost like they want it to go back that way. Like more people are wanting to join because they want it to go back into that way. Do you have a sense like that? Yes, I, I totally agree with you 100%. In, in you talk about, you know, incorporation of the ancient mysteries. This is spot on. You're dead correct. Um, you know, I'm not going to belabor this too long, but, you know, you will clearly see in the Blue Lodge, you know, just we can put the high degrees aside in the Blue Lodge, the third degree ritual, for lack of a better word, is a solar allegory. It's a retelling of the Osirian Egyptian cycle. Mm -hmm. You know, Osiris was this Egyptian sun god who's killed and resurrected. You will see this, you know, in the Blue Lodge where Hiram Abith is killed and resurrected. You know, and you will have references to his wife, consort, sister, Isis as well. Um, this would be kind of what you would call in Gnosticism, you know, the masculine and the sacred fem feminine. Within Rosicrucianism, this is known as the alchemical wedding. Um, and, you know, you, you, you know, and also, you know, you know I, I have to say that you will see these mystical elements also in the higher degrees. In the Royal Arch, you will have numerous astral references, solar references, you know, and this is all coming out of one Enoch also. Um, and then you're correct. Um, in the William Morgan affair, we're talking 1825, 1826, we're, we're talking in America, of course. Um, you know, where we have in 1776, where you have a lot of the founders, this character named DeWitt Clinton, who's this former governor of New York, are really, you know, using Freemasonry and its tools, or not its tools, its symbols, its philosophy, its moral lessons as nation-building devices. 
this is your, you know, this is completely true. I mean, I, I say in the Royal Arch book, you know, in my book, I, I call the United States the world's first Masonic Republic. But um, anyway, yeah, they, it really worked in a lot of fellowship. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you will see Masonic iconography on the Great Seal. Um, you know, you 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 will have numerous state, you know, logos, flags, seals, college seals that that reflect Freemasonry. Um, and you know, but but getting back to what you were talking about originally, you know, with the William Morgan affair, yeah, I mean, this was where this guy threatened to reveal this guy named William Morgan threatened to reveal a lot of Masonic secrets. Make a long story real short. Short. He was taken over the Canadian border, killed. The Masons who did it were put in trial in a kangaroo court. They were all acquitted. The Whit Clinton, who was a high-ranking Freemason, got involved, and Masonry was viewed as this sort of subterfuge clandestine conspiratorial organization instead of um, being viewed as a patriotic organization. It nearly wipes masonry out. Masonry survives it by going, you know, by reemerging as this philanthropic, like you said, family-friendly organization. It's this, it's this sort of identity that masonry, you know, the masonry allows it, it survives this attack by doing that, and it's really this, this you know, interpretation that kind of lasts throughout the 19th century throughout the 20th century, and it's really now, of late, it's been going on, I'd say, probably in the last 10 years, where you have the pendulum now swinging back the other way, where more and more people are joining it um, for the esoterica, you know, for the mystical tradition, for the occult symbols, things like that. I mean, that, that is without question um, going on right now. Well, it feels like people are getting where they more, they, they like the, the separatist ideas. They don't like, it's like more and more people are waking up, they don't like following the norm, and they like what it stood for not that it's of course it's always you know one bad apple can ruin the whole bunch and that's kind of what happened back then with the the william morgan thing uh but it seems like more and more people are wanting it to be back to where they like the the older studies the the stranger studies because i know that that you can be both i mean you don't have to be a christian you can actually be muslim hindu buddhist anybody can join as long as you believe in a higher power a higher right? power but i know it makes a division at the scottish right and the york, york right. right the york is the Knights Templar, that's where you have to you have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and go right. on from there. And then the Scottish Rite is pretty much, I wouldn't say agnostic, but it's it's open to all the others. Is that correct? Well, you, you're, you're sort of correct. It, it's, you're pretty much right. Um, when it comes to Blue Lodge Freemasonry, this is just the Blue Lodge. You're right, it's deism. This is what's called deism. This is just belief in a supreme being. You can be a Christian and join it. You can be, like you, you named off those religions. You can be all those as long as you believe in a supreme being. You can also not... You can believe in a supreme being and not necessarily be a Christian or Jew or Muslim also. Mm -hmm. um, but when you get into the Scottish and New York Rite, I mean, a lot of the rituals parallel each other. They're both born, in a nutshell, out of the same thing, this higher degree ceremonial called the Rite of Perfection. Um, the guy who's behind the York Rite, make, I'll try to condense this. You have these <laughs> 25, no, you have these, it's, important, it's important to explain this because um, you have these 25 degrees coming out of Paris, France, um, they, they get set up in America by this guy in Albany, New York, known as Henry Franken. Um, and it's these 25 degrees that ultimately become the Scottish Rite, degrees 4 through 32 in 1801. And they also influence heavily the guy who's behind the York Rite of Freemasonry, a guy named Thomas Smith Webb. Um, and y if you read the works of Thomas Smith Webb, you'll find the fingerprints of Franken's Lodge all over it from start to finish. Um, but, but, you know, a lot of the York Rite reflects the Scottish Rite, you're correct. The now with the the Scottish Rite, you know, you know, it just ends at the thirty second. Now the York Rite technically ends with the the Knights Templar ceremonial, which is your right is you have to accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior. It's really Christian Freemasonry. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't have anything against it or anything. I know people who have been of other faiths who have joined the York Rite and have just stopped at that ceremonial. They just don't go any further. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a little odd for me personally, but it, it, I, I have no problem with that. I mean, I have met Freemasons. Um, it, it really seems to be more of a local flavor than anything. It, it seems to be territorial, where if you don't complete the Rite and you don't join the Knights Templar, you really have no, you know, and you don't want to, you know, take the Christian confession, you kind of really don't want to join it. I've talked to other people in other parts of the country who said, oh, yeah, you know, I'm Jewish. I joined the York right years ago. I just stopped at that ceremonial. I just didn't go any further. No big deal. So, I mean, it, it, it seems to be sort of a local flavor almost um, of how people want to do it. I, I joined the Scottish Rite just because all, all my family members who are Masons all did the Scottish Rite, and that appealed to me. Um, 
Oh, I, ha- I have loads of friends who have done the York right. I have loads of friends who have done the Scottish right. I also need to point out that the York and Scottish rights are not mutually exclusive. Um, you can do both of them. Um, once you're a Blue Lodge Master Mason, you can do the Scottish right, you can do the York right, you can do both. You can also do neither of them. It's, it's completely up to you. Yeah, I've got a, a good friend at work that is uh, completed all that, and he's actually a Knights Templar. He went through all of his Masonic training and all that, and that's what he is now. Yeah, I, I know I know a, a, a couple. Um, when I was in Oxford, I knew some of my friends over there had subsequently joined um, Masonic Lodges, and a lot of them have done both rights, or, or both York and Scottish Rite Freemasons. There's no prohibition against joining one or the other. Um, you, know, you can join both, you can join one, you can join neither. It's completely up to you. That's great. All right, now we're going to fast forward to present day with your book. Does, okay. we're, without giving away too much, it, I know it's going to go into, because you really can't give away step by step what goes on with, with that ceremony, but that ceremony, does it seem like now it's being, I guess, I won't say suppressed. Was it suppressed in overall Masonic and now it's being more accepted? Or is that, is it something new? Is it now all of a sudden they're going back to this, this Arch of Enoch ceremony? Oh, no, no. The, the, the Royal Arch Ceremonial is the, um, the this, is, this comes out of Paris, France in the 17, um, 1740s, 1750s. This is being developed um, at a place called the College of Claremont, which is a Jesuit school. The higher degrees, I'm going to really shorten this down um, in a nutshell. Yeah, because your book um, is a monster. So <laughs> no, yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I, I know, I know. You know, I mean, I, I could answer this. I mean, I, I could spend. We could go. Minutes we could go for three so hours discussing all yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to give you the. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to give you the real condensed version here. It's being the higher degrees are being developed by the Jesuits as part of the Counter Reformation. In a nutshell, they're doing it to try to restore the Roman Catholic side of the Stuart monarchy back to the throne of England. Um, and, you know, the, the guy who, you know, they're really trying to put back on the throne is this guy named Bonnie Prince Charlie. Um, in a nutshell, the, 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 these degrees become very popular. It's 25 degrees, they're called the right of perfection, um, and they flourish throughout Europe. Um, by the time they make their way into the United States, the Jesuits um, seem to be out of the picture. They seem to have, These degrees seem to have grown their own legs. Um, but it's within this right that you have this Royal Arch of Enoch degree. I mean, it dates back to the original 25 degrees coming out of Paris, France in the 1740s. You know, in this time, it's the 13th degree. It's called the Royal Arch of Enoch. Um, when, when Franken's Lodge sets up in Albany, again, it's the 13th. Um, it's the Royal Arch of Enoch. And in the Scottish Rite system of 1801, again, it's the 13th degree. It's called the Royal Arch of Enoch. Sometimes it's called the Royal Arch of Solomon also. And in the York Rite, it's called, um, it's the seventh degree in the York Rite, um, and it's called the Royal Arch of Zorobabel in, um, in, in, in that ceremonial. Is that like Zoroastrian history? No, Zorobabel is a Jewish, you have to understand what's going on in the Masonic um, rituals, both high and blue degrees, okay. and again, I'll, I'm going to... But no, it's okay. I'm going to just plow over a ton of material here. Um, in the first degree, in, in, in the Blue Lodge, in the third degree, the ritual revolves around the temple, the, the construction of the first temple, which is Solomon's Temple. Um, and this guy who's building it is this architect named Hiram Abiff, um, and he possesses this secret word. Um, it's called the Tetragrammaton. It's the secret name of God. And make a long story real short, it's from whence all learning originates, is through the correct pronunciation of this word. He's murdered in the Blue Lodge ceremonial. When he's killed, the word is lost. It's called the lost word of a master mason. Well, if you fast forward to the higher degrees in this royal arch ceremonial, the word, the secret word, is recovered. Um, and it's recovered when, in, in, the, in, in the ceremonials, the, the, the Jews, the, the Hebrews who are in captivity in Persia, are being allowed to return to the Holy Land by this Persian emperor named Cyrus the Great. Um, and the guy who's leading the Jews back to the Holy Land is this Jewish governor named Zorobabel. His, his name literally means the path to Babylon, or the heart of Babylon, or the mouth of Babylon, depending on your translation. And in the ceremonial, they're reconstructing the second temple, or they're building it, I should say, on the Temple Mount where the first temple stood, which is, of course, Solomon's Temple. And it's during this construction phase that this, they find a secret underground vault, which is the Vault of Enoch, where they find this hidden word, the lost word of a master mason. And it, 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 what I say in the book, and like you said, the book's a monster, I, I, it, it, to me, it's, it's the symbology, the philosophy, 
you know, in the history, the underlying history and the symbolism stemming from this one degree, which is really influencing things like the United States of America, its architecture, its, its, philo- its philosophical underpinnings, um, because it's the recovery of this, you know, secret name of God, um, which is very important within Freemasonry. Um, and that's really the heart and soul of the book. And of course, you know, it's even, you know, it's doubly important because this degree, as it's being developed back in the 1740s, is incorporating elements of this lost book of Enoch, which shouldn't be happening because under, you know, you know, mainstream history, the book is lost, you know, from, you know, as we talked about at the beginning of the show, from second, third century, all the way up until 1821. (laughs) Yeah, and that this leads more into what we discussed is it feels like it was it was handed to people in secret. It's father the son, you know, it's just it's like the, the master to his his apprentice. It's just passed along that way that you can trail back to it. And, I, and I'm also glad you brought up the whole discussion of of the architecture work that it seems like is in a lot of structures in America, especially up in your neck of the woods. It seems like there is a lot of it. Almost like it's it almost like it had to be there. Can you explain some of that? I mean, is it was it was it like a requirement that some of the architectures that did some of the work for for a lot of the the U.S. government had to be masons? Well, what you have going on is, um, and I say this in the book, as I, I you know I call the country I call the United States the first Masonic Republic, and you, of course you know I mean just the architecture I'll get to in a second, but like you know you have the division of the triple division of government between the executive, the judicial, and the legislative. This comes out of Blue Lodge Freemasonry, where the government's triple divided between the worshipful master and his senior wardens. Um, and again, you know you have Masonic icons all over college logos, state you know state nicknames. You know you know the, Pennsylvania being the keystone happens to be one of them, um, and things like that. Um, when you get into the architecture. You know, you know, you, you will see Masonic imprints all over the place. You will have a lot of Masonic, ar- you know, architects who are Freemasons incorporating Masonic elements, you know, into buildings of importance. This comes out of the Renaissance. Um, this th- it comes out of two things. It, one of it is the Renaissance. A Christian mystic named Raymond Lully um, talks about how buildings of importance in his writings should be these symbolic memory temples aligned to different zodiacs, things like that. This is also carried forward by a Dominican friar named Giordano Bruno, who is into the Hermetic tradition, and he mentions this in his writings. And then, of course, you have the emerald tablet of this Egyptian, Hellenistic Egyptian sage named Hermes Trismegistus, who is of premier importance within Royal Arch Freemasonry, who carries around this thing called the emerald tablet. And on that, you have the, this maxim called as above, so below, which means that building of, buildings of importance you know, need to be aligned to, you know, the solstices, the equinoxes, different star systems. You know, you get into the federal district, for example, you know, you will have the Pythagorean right triangle formed by the um, White House, the Washington Monument, all the way up the mall to the United States Capitol, you know, back down Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, this is a Pythagorean right triangle. This is a solar reference. Um, the one side represents the sun god Osiris. One side represents his wife, consort Isis, and the hypotenuse represents their solar perfected child, Horus. 
And of course, this is, you know, A squared plus B squared must equal C squared. This is also known as the 47th proposition of Euclid. This is the emblem of a Masonic worshipful master. That's the person who runs the Blue Lodge for a year, and it, it denotes Masonic rulership in the in D.C. Again, this is created by these three, you know, structures, and each one of these structures has Masonic solar references. The White House is a replication of something called Leinster Palace, which was once used as a Masonic lodge in Dublin, Ireland. The obelisk of Washington is, of course, you know, a symbol of the Egyptian sun god Amun Re or Ra. And then, of course, the Capitol building, the dome on the Capitol, is another solar reference. Um, and, of course, you know, the, the, the whole thing within masonry is it's based, you know, the whole layout of the lodge is based on the three phases of the sun, with the worshipful master sitting in the east as the rising sun, which brings light to the lodge. The senior warden sits in the south, which is, you know, the sun at midday or high meridian. The, or, excuse me, yeah, and the, yeah, it's the junior warden sits there, and the senior warden sits in the west, representing the setting sun. The dome is an emblem of the sun god Apollo that comes out of the works of a Roman architect named Vitruvius. But getting back to the triangle, um, and of course you have the hypotenuse being Pennsylvania Avenue. Of course, Pennsylvania is the keystone state. There's a reason why Pennsylvania is called that. Um, that's come straight out of very you know deep royal arch esoterica. So you know you will see Masonic imprints, um, you know you know and symbols all over the place in the federal district. You know, which is basically what I call in the book. I, I have a chapter in the book called, um, you know, the, you know, Washington D.C., the city of the sun. You know, is basically this Masonic solar capital. Um, and again, you will see Masonic, um, you know, iconography and architecture in, you know, Baltimore, Maryland, which is where I am. Um, you'll see it on college, university campuses, um, and my book, you know, talks about that um, extensively. Well, and it seems like, you know, that you pointed it out that that our government from the ground up was kind of founded on a lot of the, the Freemasonry ideas. I mean, the whole way it's there from the Masonic government inner workings is set up was the way we were set up. And Kyle and I was talking earlier today about uh, the, some of the Masonic emblems that are on the Statue of Liberty. And I guess now that we know that a lot of it came from France, it explains how it got put on there. Yeah, well, what you have going on, you know, we talk about New York being the Empire State. There's a reason why it's the Empire. This has to do with the development of York Rite Freemasonry and the Knights Templars by um, these two, by DeWitt Clinton, who was the former governor of New York and uh, former mayor of New York City. You know, within within New York, you have numerous um, Masonic, you know, the, you know, icons, you know, or, or architectural structures going on. You've named one of the three, which is the Statue of Liberty. And if, you, if, if you've studied the Statue of Liberty, and I have a whole bit on it in the Royal Arch of Enoch book, for lack of a better word, the, the Statue of Liberty is a temple to the number seven. Um, it, is, it is festooned from, from her feet all the way to the top with the number seven. Um, and I document this in the book, and what that number seven is allegorizing is the seventh degree of the York Rite, known as the Royal Arch of Zero Babel, and it's, again, your Royal Arch um, iconography. You will see... Masonic symbolism surrounding the Erie Canal as a Masonic icon. Um, the the when the when the Erie can, the, the Erie Canal is a symbol of Masonic westward expansion, um, and we know this from the works of Salem Town, who was a Masonic ritualist. And when the um, Erie Canal opened, they actually put a they actually created a wooden royal arch um, over one of the lock systems. And DeWitt Clinton and another Royal Arch Mason named Ezra Ames basically dedicated the Erie Canal to Royal Arch Freemasonry. And the other one in New York is the template of Union College of Schenectady, New York, which my book is the only one that talks about um, the occult template of um, Union College. It's, the, um, it's a real long story, but it's a, um, it's a domed building coming out of a quadrangle. It's the rising sun as esoteric wisdom emerging from the vault of Enoch. Um, as the you know as, as esoteric wisdom, and of course Union College was the first college in the United States to offer. Um, it was one of the first colleges. I think it was the first college set up after the Revolution, but it was the first college to offer high degrees in um, civil engineering, which is of course operative Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you want to turn to um, Union College, the Erie Canal, and the Statue of Liberty, and I document all. You know, I mean, it's a real long story, but you can read more about it in the book, which my book documents um, all over the place. You got something? No, you I was going to say, yeah, I mean, a lot of the, the, the structures you're talking about that are laid out, as well as our money, and even the United States Constitution, isn't it a Masonic document? Right. I, I've, I've, I mentioned this in the book. I call the Constitution a Masonic document. For example, 
we have um, you know you know the triple division of government. Um, and again, this is what I was just mentioning, where it's the the triple division of government is a it's a solar reference, um, and it comes out of Blue Lodge Freemasonry. The you know um, the Blue Lodge, the governance of the Blue Lodge is triple divided. Again, this is the movement of the sun, of rising sun, sun at midday, um, setting sun, which is the worshipful master and his two wardens who assist him in governing the lodge. Then you also have in the um, Constitution the separation of church and state. That comes straight out of James Anderson's Constitutions of Freemasonry. This is a publication um, that comes out, I want to say, in 1721. Um, Anderson is a Presbyterian minister who writes um, the Constitutions of Freemasonry. It's bylaws. It's legendary history. There are actually songs in it as well. And one of the, one of the first articles is the separation of, is, is basically the removal of religion from Blue Lodge Freemasonry, which we mentioned, you know, he basically says you have to believe in a supreme being, but, you know, you know, we don't have a Christian, Jewish, you know, Islamic, you know, Hindu requirement. Whatever your belief system is, is your own. As long as you believe in a supreme being, God, in Masonry, this is called the great architect of the universe, um, as long as you have that there. So, yeah, you will clearly see, um, you know, you know, influences of Freemasonry upon the United States Constitution, um, and, of course, the federal capital, Washington, D.C., you know, also, you know, contains numerous Masonic, you know, icons, architecture, you know, solar, solar astral references. Um, and, you know, you know, talk, I talk about that in the book as well. Now, Robert, I know and I think I'd heard it's been several years ago, but I know that now you'd said that it goes to the 32nd degree in, in Masonic. And then the 33rd is like an honorary. It's an awarded or given degree later on. Wasn't there at some point in time? There was another group that actually started more degrees than just the 32nd. Like they added a bunch more to it, but I don't think it's right. actually gone anymore, is it? No, what you're, I think what you're talking about is when you have Scottish right, you have degrees 4 through 32, which, would be, which is the end, which is what I'm the 32nd. You have the 33rd, which is honorary. You can't solicit it. It has to be bestowed upon you by the Supreme Council. Um, you know, and it's basically for charity work, community involvement. There are... It's, um, these higher degree rights of Freemasonry, which are like degrees like 33 through like 180, things like that. Yeah, that's um, what I'm this, thinking this, about. Yeah, this, this is what's called, and I, yeah, this, and I know exactly what you're talking about, this is what's called the Rights of Memphis Misrium, um, and this is also generally known as Egyptian Freemasonry. Yeah, that's it. Um, th- 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 these rights did exist at one point. Um, um, it, it's again, um, you know, you know, sort of. Um, it, it, I, I can't really sit here and tell you it was really ever accepted into, you know, what you'd call mainstream Freemasonry. Whereas, like the Scottish Rite and New York Rite are, you know, recognized by every state grand lodge as legitimate extensions of Blue Lodge Freemasonry. The the, the rights of Memphis Misrium um, were more of a European invention. Um, I, I believe they do find their way into this country at some point, but um, the, these rights are long defunct. Um, they don't exist anymore. Um, if, if there is an, you know, and I mean, I just mentioned this in passing, um, if there is an Internet page out there holding themselves out as this right, I can assure you and your listeners that it is um, no way associated with um, <laughs> mainstream Freemasonry. It's uh, just someone acting on their own saying, hey, you know, I- I'm now Memphis, you know, I'm, I'm now creating this Web page. You know, come take a look at it. Basically. Yeah, right. Well, I was going to ask you this, too, and it's been it's been driving me nuts. How do you feel? about today's as far as like the movie's portrayal of a lot of the masonic history i know that it really got a lot of uh, of of looks at and a lot of playtime after the national treasure movies and after the the da vinci code movies the, does it feel like they're doing it justice are they doing it an accurate portrayal in your in your opinion or does it seem like they're kind of taking a little bit of artistic liberties and kind of dressing it up a little well no um I, I I think that I think that you know I, I can't I I'm not really the I mean I, I'm not really going to come on here and beat someone up or anything I'm not really the biggest Dan Brown fan in the world but yeah I will say that things like the National Treasure movie and Da Vinci Code has definitely um, you know you know has definitely had it is part of the revival of Freemasonry and especially from the mystical side I, I can't deny that um, you know I mean that that is definitely true. Um, what, what, what I talk about in the book is, and, you know, we get into the movies a little bit, um, I get into a sort of Masonic analysis, you know, or symbolic analysis of the National Treasure movies, both one and two, and the Da Vinci Code. There's a lot of, um, hidden iconography going on in those movies, 
Um, the final, ch- I just should point out, the final chapter of the Royal Arch book is called, um, the chapter is called So Dark the Con of Man, which is a line actually out of the Da Vinci Code. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I talk about some Masonic, Enochian, solar symbolism in popular movies, um, National Treasures and Da Vinci Code being one of them. Um, you get into um, the Da Vinci Code book, really, it, it, it flirts with Freemasonry. It, 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 now, the movie has some really cool esoterica going on with it that relates to Freemasonry, not in the way you would think, though. You get into the first National Treasure movie, um, and this ties in perfectly with what we were talking about tonight, is the first National Treasure movie is actually a duplication um, of the Royal Arts Ceremonial. It's, it's the location of the treasure vault um, beneath the holy ground, and of course, if you've seen the National Treasure movie, I mean, I don't want to spoil it for anybody. Yeah. But been, you know, I mean, I think it's been out for like ten years yeah. now, or whatever. I'll spoil it yeah, for them. I, mean, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Well, I mean, I mean, if, if you if you've watched the movie, I mean, again, if you haven't, you know, maybe you just want to turn the volume down right now. But it's <laughs> it's 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 the location, or excuse me, it, the National Treasure. The, the, they're locating this treasure of Freemasonry. And they're following all these Masonic clues, and of course, the treasure vault is underneath the holy ground in New York, of all places. You know, and this is the underground treasure vault. Well, I mean, the Royal Arch Ceremonial is the same thing. It's the locate, it's the recovery of the Masonic treasure beneath the Holy Ground. Excuse me, beneath the Holy Ground, which is the Temple Mount. So, I mean, the National Treasure, the first National Treasure movie, is sort of a Royal Arch um, ritual Hollywood, not, ho- you know, put together by Hollywood, yeah. for lack of a better word. Um, and Instead of gold, treasure- it's the word. In the in the ritual, yeah. looking for the word in the movies, it's got to be gold, right? Yeah, well, in in, in 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 the movie, but in the movie also, you will have the cabalistic wisdom where the woman sees the the the, the um, I forget her name, the actress name, where they find the scrolls from Alexandria. Mm-hmm. In the vault of Enoch, in in the ceremonial, it's not only the lost word of a master mason, but it's all the treasure of the lost wisdom, the wisdom inscribed on the two pillars of Enoch of mathematics and the seven liberal arts. So it's wisdom as well, and of course, you'll see that. In the um, you know you'll see that in the National Treasure movie with the scrolls from Alexandria, all the lost cabalistic wisdom. National Treasure Two has some very unique Masonic um, symbology going on. Um, I'm trying to think the one um, that I'm trying to think of when they're doing the little cipher is the word Bacon will come up. It's the first thing you'll see on the screen. Um, don't think Swine. Think Sir Francis Bacon, who was a um, proto Freemason affiliates with the Rosicrucians, it was into code-breaking and, you know, symbolism and esoterica. Then you'll have a reference to Chapter 13 of Cooper's book, which is, you know, which is all the wisdom is, and, of course, this is allegorizing this 13th degree. So you'll see it again in, um, in, 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 in National Treasure 2. In Da Vinci Code, in the da, Vin- in the da Vinci Code movie, you'll have a little in Angels and Demons, but in, in Da Vinci Code, you will see the number 13 all over the place. And especially when someone has to find out information or wisdom that leads them on the trail, you know, you'll have the Mona Lisa painting kept in, you know, Hall 13 of the Louvre. Um, and again, I, it's just, the numbers are escaping me, but if you read the book, you'll see the number 13 um, all over the place from start to finish in the Da Vinci Code movie. That do do you feel like this is going to jump back a little bit because I'm like I said, we were Kyle and I've always discussed about the history. Does it feel like that? in some of the stuff and, and what you've learned without giving away too much that the Masonic may have got the Masons may have got their founding or actually their beginnings in ancient Egypt. Or does it feel like it may have come from Sumeria? Did it come earlier? Or does it seem like that's where the actual stone masonry, because I know they've taken a lot from uh, some of the Egyptian history, a lot from the book of the dead. Book of the dead yeah. Yeah. And a lot from that. So does it seem like, like maybe that's where it actually started was the stone builders from from back in that. Well, and even the era? Egyptians, you know, used the procession of the equinoxes to lay out a lot of their monuments and mm-hmm. stuff. It seems like they adopted a lot of stuff from that time. Yeah, frame. what what you have what you have going on is you have this um, within masonry. You do have this sort of split within its legendary history. Um, you know, and and you know you, what what you have going on is um, in Anderson's constitutions he lays out this legendary history of Freemasonry. Um, and again, it is legendary, but you know, you know, where he traces it back to things like you know Egypt, the building of the pyramids, constructing things like you know the Tower of Babel, you know, which he said these builders possessed these occult you know secrets, which are handed down to these you know medieval 
Gothic stone builders, they begin allowing in non-members to talk esoterica philosophy, you know, and then in 1717 you have this Masonic organization created. I mean, and clearly within the Blue Lodge, you know, we mentioned this earlier, you will clearly see things of Mithraism, the, you know, Egyptian mysteries, you know, Zoroastrianism, Pythagoras, which I've talked about already, you know, you will clearly see that. But then you kind of have this other split within Masonic history where, and you know, this guy named Andrew My- Michael Ramsey, he's a Freemason, he's a co-founder of the Royal Society, he's the tutor of um, Bonnie Prince Charlie. He, in his oration in 1737, he comes along and he says, well, Anderson, you know, I know he talks about this legendary history with Egypt and these medieval stone workers and things like that. He said, you know, I, I kind of really don't dispute what he's talking about. He says, but Freemasonry's real history, he said, is, is owed to this group called the Knights Templar. He said Freemasonry is really Roman Catholicism under another name. He said, and, and he said, what you have going on is the Templars during their time in the Holy Land, you know, interacting with these mystical groups who are these holdovers of these ancient mystery religion schools, you know, and they're being influenced when they return to Europe. You know, these are the guys who are behind the real, you know, Gothic medieval stone builders. You know, and the Templars are the real Freemasons is what, is what you know, um, you know, is what Ramsey says. And again, this ejects, you know, your Roman Catholic, you know, Roman Catholic element into it. And again, we see the hand of the Jesuits at work here. Um, as on a per- you know, if you're asking me, you know, I mean, it's a very fair question. I mean, you know, you get these ancient mystery schools, you know, and you get Masonic authors like Manley Hall and Albert Pike and myself. I mean, I definitely believe Freemasonry is like, you know, you get into these groups, you know, the mystery schools, then you get into the Gnostics, the Cathars, you know, the stone workers, you know, the Rosicrucians. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, I mean, Freemasonry to me um, seems to be just kind of like an extension of all these groups, you know, because clearly you will see, you know, and my book talks about this from start to finish, you will see the fingerprints and the imprints of these ancient mystery schools, you know, and, and these themes, you know, of Gnosticism, um, you know, you know, the divine spark, um, you know, death and resurrection, you know, you will see this all over masonry, both in the Blue Lodge and in the higher degrees. I mean, you know, and I, I definitely see it as like, you know, sort of this modern day, some, someone asked me, I mean, I think, I think it's a good description, they said, do you think Freemasonry is a modern day mystery school? And, you know, I mean, I think I, I kind of really can't argue with that. I think that's a real good description of it. It does seem yeah, like a really yeah. good. How, now, how long does it normally, I know it's, it's probably different with everybody, but if anybody's actually wondering and they want to become a Mason, how long would they have to, say, dedicate time? Does it take, you know, months, weeks, years? What would it take in order to get in there? Like to say to get to your 32nd degree, what would it take from start to finish on average for the average person? Well, Right. It, it depends on the lodge. Some lodges rush people through it. Some don't. Um, it's it's usually for like Blue Lodge. You get the inter- You get the first degree, and then you have to do what's called a catechism, where you're asked a series of predetermined questions that have a pre set a pre predetermined answer. Once you pass that, you move on and on. I, I mean, I mean, I can tell you what it took me. Um, it. I, I mean, I I I got the. Um, I, I received the entered apprentice degree in January of 1997. So you're almost talking 16 years ago you know, almost to the day, almost. Um, and I received the Master Mason degree in September um, of that same year. So you're talking nine months it took me to, to go from entered apprentice to Master Mason in the Blue Lodge. I did the Scottish Rite thing. I did the Scottish Rite degrees in 1999. Again, you, you can sign up for the Scottish Rite where you can actually bypass certain degrees and then go back and watch them later. I kind of really don't recommend doing that. Um, you know, or if you're going to do it, at least go back and watch the degrees. I want to say, you know, off the top of my head, I want to say the Scottish Rite takes about, like, you know, th- three to six months, I want to say, to go from four to 32nd. They, some nights they do more than one degrees. Um, this may surprise some people. Some of the ceremonials last five minutes. Um, and, and I should also point out where in Blue Lodge, it's more participatory, where you're actually interacting in the rituals. Where in Scottish Rite, you kind of sit in an amphitheater, and you're watching basically a series of morality plays, now, there is portions of it where you do go on stage and interact, but, but it's Scottish right, you're kind of just watching, like, um, plays being acted out in front of you. Now, there are parts where you do participate, but it's not like in Blue Lodge where you have to put on another costume, you know, and, and you're blindfolded and you're led around the lodge half naked, you know, things like that. Um, so, you know, for Blue Lodge, it took me um, nine months to do. And, and I should point out also just real quick, in Blue Lodge masonry, there's no meetings during the summer. Um, it goes dark. So, like, if, if, you, if, you, if you're... If you wrap up your fellow craft degree in May, you'll probably have to wait until after the summer's over anyway till Master Mason and the Scottish Rite. You know, I want to say three to six months it takes. 
Well, so it's it's not something. It's not like a daunting task. I know because a lot of people, and that may be a part of the mystery and the mystique behind it too, is a lot of people acted like they felt like it may have taken them a lifetime to get to that thirty second degree, like it was going to be years. I'm sure you've been asked that before. It seems like it takes years to get there. Whenever I would say, no, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. When, whenever anybody could just because I know it turns a lot of people off. A lot of people don't have that mm-hmm. kind of dedication like it used to be in the old days. Now they want to be able to go in there and get it done and move on and, and have fun with it. Yeah, I mean, I mean. You know, you know. I mean, it, it, it varies from lodge to lodge. I mean, I know, I know, I know for a fact. I mean, I, I know because the, the lodge. When when I did the blue lodge, I mean, I went through all the rituals. I did all the catechisms. I know now that sometimes the grand lodges will offer this one day thing where you can just go up for the day, and you know, I don't even think you have to participate in it. And and you know, they, they just put the ritual one in front of you and then bestow you with the master mason degree. I mean, and as long as the grand lodge approves of it, you know, I mean, they can do stuff like that. So I mean, you you could technically, I guess. Be, be done it in a day. Um, once you become the, I mean, again, I'll just real quick. Once you become the Blue Lodge Mason or the Master Mason, again, you can sign up for the Scottish Rite or the York Rite. You can sign up for neither of them. Or you can do both of them. I wouldn't recommend doing both at the same time, though. That seems a bit but, overwhelming. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would say this much. I mean, and you talk about like being time consuming. I mean, you know, the Scottish Rite. You know, I mean, you know, you know. The, you could, what I would say is you can do it, but, you know, to understand, and this is what for me anyway, but to understand, like, what you're looking at in the symbolic interpretations and the esoterical behind it, that, that can take years of research. Um, you know, I mean, because there's a lot going on that isn't, you know, isn't being, re- I mean, it, you'll see it, but you won't understand it. I mean, and, and you know, you know like, like even when, with me, I mean, when I went through the Blue Lodge in 1997, I mean, you know, I kind of didn't understand. I mean, I understood what I was doing, but... You know, I didn't understand of the symbology of like the death and resurrected son, the mm-hmm. Osirian cycle. I mean, it wasn't until years later that you know you start reading people like Albert Pike, Albert Mackey, Manly P. Manly P. Hall, that you really begin to understand the you know power of the ritual, as it were. It's almost best if you're going to choose to do this to do a little research and really kind of throw yourself into the history and read Robert's book before you decide to go do it. That'll kind of put you on the path of of really rocking and rolling down the right way. What do you got, Philly? No, Robert, I was going to ask you now. I know you don't, you're not the official census taker of the, <laughs> of the Freemasons, but do you think, um, what are the numbers like? Are the, is the membership growing? Is it more popular than ever now, or do you think it's kind of waned in the last hundred years? I mean, I have no idea uh, if it's becoming, because of those movies, you right, know, did that right. drive I mean, it up, I, it, the membership? Or? Why? No, what, what I would say to you is... Um, what what you had going on is, um, you know, like even like twenty years ago, a lot of lodges, you know, you know, it was sort of like waning because, um, you know, people didn't really seem to be that interested in it. It, it like I said, you know, it, it was viewed as more of a charity organization, a philanthropic, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but it just seemed like, you know, just sort of like a social club, as it were. Right. That's the way we've um, always kind of viewed it. Yeah, I mean, I joined it when I joined. It was to keep on a family tradition going on, but I would say this to you. Um, you know, you know, and it is. I mean, there definitely seems to be going on right now. A lot of lodges were just more occupied with numbers and just getting people in just to keep the coffers, you know, you know, filled than they were about, like, you know, really the understanding of the esoterica. And I mean, you know, and, and it's true. I mean, things like the Internet, the National Treasure stuff, there is this revival going on where a lot of people are now joining it for the esoteric tradition, which I think is a very good thing. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I, I would say that, you know, I, it's going to take some time, but, you know, I mean, I, I think that, you know, more people are joining it than they were 20 years ago. And I think, you know, the availability of the information being on the Internet, you know, and, you know, listening to podcasts such as yours, being, at, you know, having the access to books online, you know, much more readily, you know, and again, the National Treasure movies, you know, and this sort of, you know, the esoteric symbols, you know, where more people are now, fa- you know, I mean, you know, I mean, you look at the History Channel and just stuff like that. Now, I mean, some of the programming, you know, you know, you'll see Masonic shows all the oh, time. Oh yeah, it's you know, it's, it's mean, very interesting. Mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, now some of it's kind of you know, you know, it's not as in depth as as I would like it to be, but it still it generates interest in in the material, and um, you know, I mean, it's, that, it's definitely in my eyes at any rate con- contributing to a revival of Freemasonry. You know, and more importantly to me, you know, it's mystical esoteric tradition um, that seems to be underway right now. Yeah, well, I'm sure it's more prevalent where you're at. You're in Maryland. I mean, you're not far from the capital. You know, down here where we're at, we're in, like, the Bible Belt. So, I mean, I know that the, the Freemasons are here, but they're probably not as prevalent here as they are up there. But it does well, seem with, you know, the history of the way this whole country was set up, um, I think it's fascinating. It's really interesting. 
Well, you're, 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 I mean, I don't want to, um, you're in Texas, I believe you told yes, me. Yes, yes. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, I got a whole thing on Texas um, in, in the Royal Arch book. I mean, numerous founders of Texas were all Masons, um, you know, and uh, you get into the Alamo, all those guys were all Masons. Oh, David okay. Crockett and, you know. Uh, Looks like Cal and I are going to have to become a Mason. That's what it sounds yeah, like. We're going to have to uh, join. Davy Crockett and Jim Bowie and all those guys were Masons, and, um um, yeah, I, I know we're you know running up against it, but um, the reason why uh, your state is called the Lone Star is Freemasonic. And you oh, can really? Read all about that in the book? Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. It sounds like your book, though, isn't just like the first. Uh, it feels like you're writing like a trilogy or something. Have you got more stuff planned for us, Robert? If you are you coming out with more and more and more? It feels like this is just like the tip of the iceberg or the start of the the walls of the house. What what all have you got going on with us? Well, I really, I really appreciate you asking me that question. Um, well, the, the final chapter of the Royal Arch of Enoch book is the movie Symbolism, and I picked about six movies where I talked about solar references, Masonic, Enochian symbolism. There were other movies I wanted to talk about, but they kind of really didn't fit into the book. So I wrote a second book called Cinema Symbolism, a guide to esoteric imagery in popular movies. <laughs> and um, this book should be out. I'm, I'm shooting for a March-April release date of this book of 2014, um, and this book deals with, you know, hidden Masonic, you know, esoteric numerological symbols. I get into like the Star Wars trilogies, uh, Back to the Future movies, um, the Matrix movies, which is a Gnostic fable from start to finish. Um, I get into a lot of the movies, you know, you know, you know, the esoterical with these movies. This book should be out, um, like I said, in a couple months, three, three to four months. I'm hoping um, it's done. The book is complete. Um, and like I said, when this book comes out, we can do this all over again. Yeah, it sounds yeah, absolutely. It, it know, sounds like a talk- trilogy, man. It just feels like you're coming with more of it. Like it just keeps well, going. Well, well, and, that, and then what, what happened? What happened next was um, there were even more <laughs> movies I wanted to talk about. So I'm actually writing as we speak, Cinema Symbolism Two. It's cool. <laughs> um, that that's probably at least a year away. And I've, I've also started outlining another book on Freemasonry, but that's probably two years away. I've also started working on my first work of fiction. But um, that I'm kind of keeping under wraps right now. There you but go. the cinema symbolism book should be out in the next three to four months. And you know, we talked about like just real quick to give people a preview. We talked about John Dee earlier, you know, and of course his his sig- sigil signature to Queen Elizabeth zero zero seven. And you know, I get into the whole James Bond John Dee connection with why James Bond is 007. That ties into Doctor John Dee. Fle- Fleming was very much into the esoteric. He worked for British intelligence and was the handler of a Freemason um, named Aleister Crawley, who who was one of the darker, more esoteric yeah, people yeah. in history. Yeah, and you know, Fleming was good friends with him, and uh, th- that's a whole hidden history right there. That, but that's yeah, interesting. Cinema, yeah, Cinema Symbolism, um, that book should be out in a couple months. Oh, like yep. I said, March, April. and um, We'll get you back out, on we'll, for that. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll do this all over again. Well, where can everybody find you? Is it Where's the best way to go to your website to get the books, or is it just a typical everybody goes to Amazon, or how's the best way to find your stuff? Sure, the books are on Amazon. Um, you can go to my website, which is www.robertwsullivaniv.com, and my name's the fourth, so it's the letter I, the letter V.com. From there, there are links to buy the book. Um, it's an oversized paperback form. This is the Royal Arch of Enoch book. Of course, the Cinema Symbolism book's not out yet. But, um, you know, you can get the oversized paperback. It's in Kindle and Nook. Um, these are available from my publisher at rsplaunchpad.com. You can find them on Amazon and Barnes & Noble as well. It's a 700-page book for uh, $10, so you can't go wrong. Um, you know, it's $9.99 in ebook format. And again, it's on Kindle. It's in the Apple iBook Store, $9.99. And from my website, you can get links there. And there are links to all my social media my YouTube channel. There's Facebook like pages set up for all this. Um, Your you Twitter. Can follow me on Twitter. Yeah, Twitter, of course. You can follow me there. And again, that's www.robertwsullivaniv.com. And on the um, upper right side, you'll see a link to buy the book. That is perfect. Well, Robert, don't run off. We're going to wrap this up. We'll talk to you off air. But thank you so much yeah, thanks. for coming on. That is very my interesting. Mind my mind is completely blown. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm going to have to become a Mason. That's plain and simple. i got to go do it now. But your family, you, you have know, Masons in your family. I know. There's no excuse, is there? No, not There's at all. There's no excuse. You're going to. And like I said, read my book. You'll find out why Texas is the lone star. That yeah, I'm going to have to get it. It's going to happen. Yeah, that comes straight out of Freemasonry. It's going to happen. I want to get one. I want it autographed, though. I'm going to have to get it from you. 
Yeah, I can, we, we can arrange a signature or something like that. Perfect. Talk off air or whatever. Sounds good, Robert. Thank you so much. And, hey, stay warm and stay safe, my friend. Hey, listen, thank you guys for having me on. I really appreciate it, and um, it was great being a guest on um, your program tonight. Thank you. We're back. What did you think of that? It makes me. I'm going to become a mason. Yeah, I think so. I, really I want to become. Do it. Uh, I want to become a knight templar. I really think I want to be a mason. And I mean, maybe like I, I can finally find out where the ark of the covenant is really hidden. It's in Oak Island. You think? No. <laughs> could be in Ethiopia. <laughs> it could be in Ethiopia. Yeah. According to Graham Hancock. Yeah, that's a good book too. If we're going to start talking about some cool history books and all that that tie into that, yeah, that's a good book. The sign and the seal. The sign and the awesome. seal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I really, I really think I may have to look into the whole, the whole Mason thing. It'd be something cool to take a little. I mean, the lodge not too far from where we're at right now. Well, there's lodges in almost everybody's yeah. town, and it's really, it really is neat the way that Washington D.C.'s laid out, and uh, a lot of the documents and our money and everything has so much to do with Freemasonry the architecture. I'm really interested in the book he's got coming out also too of all the movies. Yeah, that's what he talks about all because I mean I had no idea some of the stuff he was talking about even off air with some of the wild tie-ins of the movies and things like that. So it's going to make a really interesting book. So hopefully this summer we'll be able to have him come back on. We'll discuss some of that and it'll be. I mean everybody loves the national treasures and things like that are fun to talk about. But he's I mean he's hitting on movies that I had no idea had Masonic ties. And I guess that may be something you would see if you would you know had some Masonic training. Yeah. No, so, I don't, you know I like to learn the the secret handshakes and things like that. The pass grips and <clears throat> I mean he's. He talks about some really interesting things that I'm totally lost about. So I, mean, I think it would be fun to, to be part of the Masons and, and really check into that. The whole Royal deal. Arch of Enoch is the book. So, yeah. So, of course, now I say we would like to do it. I don't know when we're going to have time, but it would still be. I mean, I'm, we're sitting, but there's books all around us. Yeah, I don't know when we would have time to do it, but uh, we may have to squeeze it in. And he said something about it usually closes during the summer. So maybe in the yeah, fall I mean, that's or what something he said. Like I don't that. have any idea how it all works. I'd like to go to a, a, a lodge and just... You know, kind of see what it's like. I don't know what it even looks. You like. think they have like a day open to the public like that, where they like to bring somebody know. in? Or I wonder if you got to talk to somebody. I'm sure you got to talk to. Somebody. <laughs> I may have to check into that. I may have to do a little phone call around because I know I've got a few phone numbers from some of the the men that my grandfather worked with. Yeah, so at least you it, have so. an inside. I don't have anybody in my family. Yeah. I think that belongs to that. We'll check it all out and see what's going on. See if we can't squeeze in there. And what else is going on? <sighs> Not much, baby. The show's rolling great. I mean, we've got. We got the greatest listeners ever. I mean, we've got a lot of emails. We've got guys that are still, you know, everybody's rating and reviewing. More Twitter followers, some Facebook followers. I mean, it just seems to be going great. Uh, Craig Woolheater's got the, the the weird text fest coming up in March. We're That's gonna, right. We're going to go down there. I don't know that we're going to record. We're still kicking around the idea about doing that. I don't think we're going to record. I don't know if we want to pack everything up and go down there. I want to go and enjoy myself. That's me. And I haven't really I, gotten I, to I go to one I of these. I can't listen to all the, the, the presentations and the... And the shows, if I'm busy there trying to record, you know what I mean? Yeah. All the presentations that are going to be up there, like Nick. I mean, he's given one on his new book, Close Encounters. Close Encounters, I can't talk. Did you have a stroke? The Fatal Kind. <laughs> Is it The Fatal Kind? Yeah, I think so. So, I mean, I'd love to hear that. That's something. That, yeah, exactly. And, and Lyle's going to be there. He's going to be talking about the, the Lizard Man. The Lizard Bishop Man. Yeah. Rita Louise, she's going to be there. Uh, Ken's going to be there. I mean, there's going to be a bunch there. And I would like to go, I'd like to go mingle and everything. And it's... I've never gotten to go to a large lecture like this with a whole bunch of speakers. And I really don't want to shoot myself in the foot and go down there and set up all of our stuff and get everything set up to record and get to miss out on the lectures. You know, I kind of yeah, want to be me. part of that deal. 
So if they do it again, we may record. But right now, I don't think we're going to. But we are going to be there. there. Yeah, definitely going. So anybody that's around here in this Texas area or any of our listeners that's going to be coming through in this whole area, uh, I would love to tell you the dates, but I'm an idiot. So I'm talking out of my ass because I totally forgot when the date was right now. March. March. We'll put it up. We'll talk about it some more. But yeah, if y'all want to come down there, we're going to be down there. You'll be able to find us. We'll probably stick out like sore thumbs. So you'll see us, and we'll be glad to shake hands and the whole deal. Uh, yeah, that's really the only thing that we've got going up. There's a few more stuff. I know that I've been contacted by a few people that would like us to go uh, do some ghost hunting, do a little paranormal ghost oh, hunting really? with them. Yeah, I'm not going. I'm scared to do that. I mean, I'll go. I'll go bigfooting or anything like that. Yeah. I'm scared with the paranormal stuff that. Some ghost is going to follow me home. Well, that's what I've always said is you can tell if Bigfoot's hiding in the back seat of your truck. You can't tell if there's like a black demon spirit creepy thing hiding back in there like one of them fogs or the old hag. I'm not down with that. So I appreciate it. I would love to interview those guys and talk to them and all that, but I, I'm kind of scared on the whole well, ghost Well, that's me. Deal. Yeah, I don't, I don't really like to deal now, with how ridiculous that. is that? I'll go out in the dark in the middle of the night with just a bow if I'm bow hunting or just a flashlight, just walking and looking for things and things. I don't mind that at all. No, it doesn't bother me. But I can't go in like a creepy old like prison or an old hotel, like the Baker Hotel. Yeah, no way. And it, there's, I'm not doing that, man. No, I'm not sleeping uh, there. No, no, no. I'm not even going to go in there by myself. No. Why is that? I don't know. It's uh, the unknown. That's what's so creepy. But there's people that are terrified of the woods, and I, that doesn't bother me at the shoot least. You can't whip a ghost ass. I mean, he just goes right through. That's true. I don't think I could whip Sasquatch's ass come down to it. But I, I always do. wanted to know when it comes to ghosts. In yeah. a two-story house... How do they not upstairs? fall through the floor? Yeah, they not just I don't the floor? know. <laughs> I've always wanted to know that. How do you go up? Like you always see this, these ghosts are going upstairs. How? Yeah. How do you walk upstairs if you fall through stuff? Man, I don't know. I don't understand that. I don't. I, like, but I'm not a paranormal dude. What is the show on? Is it sci-fi? I think. Oh, I can't think of it. Where they have it's not ghost encounters, but it's like creepy things happen. Like one I saw was a house was surrounded by werewolves. One I saw a fella in Arlington. And he had all these little demons that were in his house. I don't know, but it sounds pretty interesting. Oh man, I'll have to figure out what the name of that show is. But it's pretty neat, and they got a lot of creepy stuff like that. That does sound pretty interesting. I can't interesting. think of the name. It's not Monsters and Mysteries in America. That's on American or Destination America. Man, it's on Sci Fi. I'll have to find it. It maybe it's the Unexplained Files. You know, that there's so many right. of those yeah, shows that, that I watch. About right. I lose track of what's what. Well, folks, whenever you get done listening to this episode, of course, the next episode is going to be Kyle and I again. And I think, Kyle, I'm going to do a, 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 there's a little heads up. I think I'm going to do something on the Stephenville Lights. Ooh, I think I'm going to do a lot of research and do a segment on the Stephenville Lights from the, all the sightings that they had down there. I think I'm going to do one on uh, breakdancing. And typical moves. Here we go. Uh, we're going to break down some moves on break dancing. <laughs> Is that what we're going to do? I'm going to talk about parkour. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <clears throat> you don't know what you're going to do yours over yet? I have no yet? idea. I, I think the Stephenville Lights, is, I've really been wanting to do that. You know, we've been talking about it. I think I'm going to look at it. You know, we really that. should because we're so close to Stephenville. We're like an hour away. If that. Yeah, if that. Depending on who's driving. Yeah. I could get there under an hour. Easy. Not me, man. You know, I just like to cruise. I'm not. I'm not in a hurry for anything. <laughs> but yeah, I think I'll do that on on my segment. I think I'll dig into that. So mm-hmm. if you folks like a little ufology, I'll try not to butcher it up too much. You know, we should look fun. into that sheriff deputy that was done all those interviews. Maybe the constable. We could, we could get him on. I bet we could. Lee Linder. Could, what was his name? I bet we could at least call him. And and I don't get him know to do anything today. You know, I don't know the name of shows, names I'm of lost. people. I'm completely lost. totally lost. I don't know why I'm, I'm out of it. I'm really out of it. I mean, I I don't know. I'm an idiot. Yeah. Tonight's interview was. It's fun. probably because I'm so full after we eat. So yeah, I need to go. I need to get up and go run a mile or two. Well, let's get let's wrap this thing up. And we'll let y'all get back to it. Thanks so much for being part of this this whole time. We've really enjoyed it. If you'd like to, or we'd really enjoy you writing a review and rating the show on iTunes. Visit or, the website or any of your anywhere you get your podcast. Throw a review up there for us. It would be awesome. It really helps us out. If uh, like I said, if you got something you want to send us, it's crazy and wacky. We'll check it out. We'll go to send it to uh, P.O. Box 10, Weatherford, Texas. 76086. Yeah, send us something crazy. Find something in there. You know what I really like? If any of y'all have ever done a cast or have like a, a – I'd like to have a Bigfoot print to hang in here. And I don't know where to find a good Bigfoot print. Hmm. So let's. I'd like to have a Bigfoot print to put up in here. Call Justin Smeha. I'm going to slap the shit out of you when we turn this thing off. (laughs) Folks, thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. You're going to hear a warm hand touch Kyle's face. (laughs) Good night.